At the beginning of the 20th century, New York City was no stranger to crime and mob activity. Police officers were in the pockets of crime families, bootlegging and illegal gambling were booming businesses, and mob bosses ran the city. Over in Harlem, illegal gambling known as numbers rackets was the name of the game. You know, the numbers racket is it's just a fascinating part of American history, uh, you know, recent history, really. Um, it's essentially a street lottery. Yeah, they're similar to a, a lottery. Um, what they are primarily is they were known in the, uh, in, in the black community. The top dog in the Harlem numbers scene was a far cry from the Italian-American mafiosos New York was famous for. Madame Stephanie St. Clair, a black female Caribbean immigrant, quickly rose through the ranks as one of the most successful policy bankers in history. She had a very loyal uh, set of employees, and, uh, and she supposedly was earning as much for herself as much as $250,000 a year uh, at that time, which is just huge money in the 1920s. Um, she became known uh, as Queenie or Madam Queen. She embraced her nickname, using her wealth to seat herself next to the Harlem elites of the time. Sinclair did not conceal her occupation, nor was she ashamed of her chosen line of work. Her neighbors knew who she was and how she earned a living. In fact, her larger-than-life personality and extravagant lifestyle made her actually difficult to miss in a Harlem celebrity. One former 409 Edgecombe resident recalled that Stephanie Sinclair was just as fascinating as the building's more respectable residents. She remembers, quote-unquote, Stephanie Sinclair breezing through the lobby with her fur coat. She had a mysterious aura about her, and she wore exotic dresses with a colorful turban wrapped around her head. But as her wealth and success grew, so did the target on her back. And she was um, able to, uh, you know, uh, cash in on that with her own investments and, and the like. And she um, became extremely wealthy by doing so. That being said, she also became a target. This is Mafia. There's a lot of mystery surrounding the early years of Stephanie St. Clair. While nothing is certain, it is believed she was born sometime around 1897 in Guadalupe in the West Indies. LaShawn Harris is an author and an associate professor of history at Michigan State University. Some scholars and some journalists say she was born in Martinique. Others say that she was born in Guadalupe. Uh, she had several siblings. She migrated to North America sometime in the 1910s, specifically Canada and Harlem. By the time she was 13, she was an orphan. And after saving up some money, she left her home in the Caribbean for work. Jeff Schumacher is the vice president of exhibits and programs for the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. She emigrated alone through New York to Montreal in 1911. And she was only 13 years old at that time. She was contracted to work as a domestic servant in a French household in Montreal. Five years later, she moved to Harlem in New York City. Within Canada and also in Harlem, she may have worked as a domestic worker and perhaps worked as a seamstress before getting involved in the numbers racket. You know, this is what we know about her, her youth, that uh, you know, she was independent basically from age 13 on. And, uh, and was making her own way in the world. Stephanie St. Clair arrived in New York City right before a time known as the Great Migration. Elwood Watson is a professor of history, African American studies, and gender and sexuality studies at Tennessee State University. The Great Migration was uh, an event where many uh, millions of blacks from the, uh, left the South and moved to the North and in efforts of uh, better opportunities as well. And then they found obviously racism in the North as well. But uh, it wasn't quite as you know blatantly violent as it was in the South uh, on a number of levels as well.
Is there something interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? This past year has been difficult for everyone, myself included. That's why I'm so thankful for BetterHelp. BetterHelp was able to assess my needs and match me with my own licensed professional therapist. And truly, my therapist has been a lifesaver. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log in to your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional online counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. That's Better H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And Mafia listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com forward slash Mafia. During this time, St. Clair used her foreign status as an advantage. It is believed that due to her ability to speak French, she was able to improve her own status. She was um, French Caribbean, and in the United States at that time, being French Caribbean in the city and urban areas uh, was a kind of a, uh, an advantage for her because she was able to speak French. And um, she used that fact that she was of uh, French Caribbean heritage, and um, she used that as a kind of a weapon to enact a degree of superiority among other African Americans. You have to realize this was the early 20th century and, you know, a time of deep racial, legal racial strife and degradation and humiliation that was directed toward uh, people of color. She uh, was well aware of that fact and she did not hesitate to utilize uh, the fact that she was Caribbean and could speak foreign languages uh, or at least one foreign language to her advantage. Her early days in Harlem were not out of the ordinary for the time. She spends, I believe, a significant amount of time as a domestic worker or as a low-wage uh, worker and also as a housewife. In terms of her socialization within early 20th century New York, she may have socialized with church uh, members, neighborhood folk, uh, people who were from uh, Guadeloupe or the French Caribbean, as well as some of her husband's relatives. Given what we know about black women's labor in New York, um, in terms of domestic work, that could have meant she cleaned um, other people's house, particularly uh, white New Yorkers. That could mean she served as a cook. That could also mean she served as a laundress. But given, again, what we know about black women's labor in urban settings, she probably cleaned house. She probably cleaned the houses of white New Yorkers. After moving to Harlem, St. Clair married a man named George. However, the two eventually separated. And we think that they married in a Catholic church in Manhattan, which suggests that they were both Catholics. Um, it seems that both George and Stephanie never divorced. And I say this because on his 1947 death certificate, Stephanie Sinclair is still listed as his wife. There are several accounts of Sinclair being involved in other relationships. But like many of the events in her life, this is shrouded in legend and mystery. Eventually, St. Clair began to work as a policy banker, and it is here that her journey to infamy takes off. She became um, the leader of a local gang called the 40 Thieves that was an extortion and theft racket, and she pretty much um, invested $10,000 of her own money uh, into what, she called a, uh, what we call today a numbers racket. Sometime in the early to mid-1920s, Stephanie Sinclair, who was probably in her mid-30s, established her numbers operation in Harlem. According to one newspaper article, Stephanie Sinclair, quote-unquote, after having made a half a dozen killing from lucky numbers at the numbers racket, became a banker, end quote. According to one journalist, Stephanie Sinclair came to America penniless, unable to speak anything but French, 
but possessing a keen mother wit which enabled her to amass a fortune in the policy racket. Another newspaper editorial may explain how Stephanie Sinclair obtained money to launch her numbers business. In 1923, Stephanie Sinclair filed a lawsuit against her apartment building owner and a city marshal, claiming she was illegally evicted from her apartment on West 135th Street. In that particular lawsuit, Madam Stephanie Sinclair claimed that eviction papers by the city marshal were never served on her and that her furniture, silverware, and other household effects were placed on the street, which were later stolen by bystanders. Siding with Stephanie Sinclair, a local Manhattan court rewarded her a judgment of about $1,000. Money received from that particular lawsuit perhaps was used to finance Sinclair's gambling business. Policy banking or numbers rackets were a common form of illegal gambling in New York. Players would pick three numbers with the hopes of winning big. You know, the numbers racket is it's just a fascinating part of American history, uh, you know, recent history, really. Um, it's essentially a street lottery. Yeah, they're similar to a, a lottery. Um, what they are primarily is they were known in the, uh, in, in the black community. For people, it was like a community pastime, uh, like playing slot machines today, maybe. Uh, but it was also a chance of winning, a chance of changing your life. If you hit the number, you know, there was a very track possibility that you'd have enough money to really move forward on something in your life. So what would happen is there would be numbers runners, and these numbers runners would go around the community, and people would give them the numbers they wanted to play that day. Typically, a three-digit number would cost five cents. So you'd give them your five cents, and you'd say, my number is uh, four, five, six. And that number would be written down on a piece of paper, and uh, then that would be taken back to the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in this case, Stephanie St. Clair. The winning numbers were selected in a variety of ways, sometimes uh, from the results of horse races that day, uh, sometimes uh, stock market reports. You know, they would look for different ways to, to randomly select the winning numbers. And then the winners would be paid off the next morning. So a winner might get $20 or $50, uh, which was a lot of money in, in the 1920s, uh, in these working class neighborhoods. So at the end of the day, then the policy banker, so that's what Stephanie St. Clair was. She was a policy banker, as they called them. She would pay the runners. She would pay the controllers, the clerks, and the support staff a percentage of what they earned on a daily basis. So they were employers. I mean, this was a business, and it was an illegal business, but it provided employment to a lot of people in the community. This episode of Mafia is brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0. Join 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code MAFIA at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0, and I'm blown away by the performance. The craftsmanship and details on the 4.0 are next level. In the past, I avoided downstairs maintenance for fear of hurting myself. But with the 4.0, it's easy to use, works great, and best of all, no nicks or cuts. This upgraded trimmer includes a multifunction on-off switch that can engage a travel lock. It also gives you the ability to turn the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. The Lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths with sizes 1 to 4. Did I mention wireless charging? The new wireless charging system uses electromagnetic induction, which can help battery length last longer. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code MAFIA at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code MAFIA. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. In 1923, 
St. Clair invested $10,000 to develop her own numbers racket. A large chunk of change now, but it was a shockingly large amount of money for the time. It's a lot of money. Uh, it's not clear where she got that much money, uh, but she could have saved it up from her work in the numbers racket. People wonder, well, how successful was she? I mean, she was incredibly successful. She was well-known, well-regarded in the community. Along with making an enormous amount of money, St. Clair allegedly aided her community. She provided jobs to many of the people in Harlem and was rumored to have donated some of her wealth. Perhaps speculative, but, but perhaps generous. Um, Stephanie Sinclair may have donated money to her local church. She may have donated money to uh, a number of Caribbean mutual aid organizations. She may have loaned uh, funds or money to friends and families, etc. If she was really invested in black progress and survival projects that embrace ideas about racial uplift, she would have probably donated money to local civil uh, rights organizations such as the NAACP, the National Urban League, and other race and gender-based national and local civil rights organizations. If we're also talking about helping or aiding the African-American community, Stephanie Sinclair employed black numbers runners and clerks, and she also employed bodyguards, and she employed black women household workers as domestics and maids and cooks. She had a very loyal uh, you know, set of employees, and, uh, and she supposedly was earning as much for herself as much as $250,000 a year uh, at that time, which is just huge money in the 1920s. Um, she became known uh, as Queenie or Madam Queen. People often say that the numbers uh, bosses in, in places like Harlem and elsewhere were, were described as kings and queens. And one of the reasons for that was not only were they providing jobs for people, but they also were philanthropists in the community. They often helped out nonprofits and other community groups, you know, because they were they made a lot more money than everybody else. And so they were able to share in the proceeds. Business was booming for Stephanie St. Clair. She was quickly establishing herself as not only one of the most successful women, but one of the most successful black women in Harlem. I was very successful. I made her a very wealthy woman, <laughs> you know. So you know, so she was extremely wealthy, and um, for the time period. And I think she, uh, upon her retirement, she had about seven hundred thousand dollars. I'd say about five, about almost better part of a half million dollars back then because of wise investments, which and that was like we're talking about the nineteen thirties. So by today's standards, we're talking about what um, almost seventy, eighty years later. So we're talking about probably what two or three million dollars. The equivalent of that would be probably today maybe even more. A policy banker like Stephanie St. Clair was, was seen in, in very high regard in the community because this was a person who employed people, it was a person who gave you a chance to win money, and uh, they needed to have a good reputation. So they, you know, there weren't too many crooked policy bankers because they, they, if they lost people's trust, then people wouldn't buy numbers from them anymore. It was also considered like a victimless crime, right? Uh, you know, it, it was, there was no violence. There was no, uh, no who nobody was getting hurt. Uh, but sometimes the police still frowned upon it, and numbers runners would be arrested. Uh, and also, you know, the bankers frequently had to arrange regular payments uh, to judges and police in order to uh, continue operating. That was sort of part of the business arrangement. Her success was reflected in her lifestyle. With the fortune she was making, she was able to move into a prestigious Harlem apartment where her neighbors included some of the most influential black intellectuals, writers, and race advocates of the time. She lived in the most fashionable building in Harlem. It was uh, famously 409 Edgecombe Avenue, uh, which was the same place where the famed uh, philosopher and writer W.E.B. Du Bois lived, as well as Thurgood Marshall, who would go on to become a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Uh, these were her neighbors, and you know she would. She was still the, the the you know the top person in the roost. I mean, she wore fur coats and she rode around in a limousine, and uh, people looked up to her. Sinclair did not conceal her occupation, nor was she ashamed of her chosen line of work. 
Her neighbors knew who she was and how she earned a living. In fact, her larger-than-life personality and extravagant lifestyle made her actually difficult to miss in a Harlem celebrity. One former 409 Edgecombe resident recalled that Stephanie Sinclair was just as fascinating as the building's more respectable residents. She remembers, quote unquote, Stephanie Sinclair breezing through the lobby with her fur coat. She had a mysterious aura about her and she wore exotic dresses with a colorful turban wrapped around her head. St. Clair was seen by many as being sophisticated and larger than life. She was also known to be incredibly arrogant with a quick temper. She was conscientious. She was socially conscientious. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that she was Caribbean. And there's been many talks and discussions about the fact that a lot of times black Caribbeans had their freedom centuries before African-Americans did here in the United States. Um, and because of that, her mindset, I think, was a lot more independent and she felt much more uh, willing and able. She felt she was equally even better than many, you know, uh, white Americans. And at that time, that was a very, very bold uh, attitude to partake uh, in and, and also could be very dangerous, obviously. IP Vanish is a virtual private network, or a VPN for short, which is a super important tool that helps you safely browse the internet. What do you do on the internet is no one else's business but yours, and IP Vanish helps you remain anonymous and secure on the internet. You can use a VPN on your computers, tablets, phones, and even things like your Fire Stick when you're streaming media. A VPN will encrypt all of your data, what you're reading, what you're searching, what you're watching, whatever it is you're doing. For listeners of the show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off. Just $3.49 for the first month or $31.49 for the year. Here's everything you get with IP Vanish. Anonymous IP addresses, which means your personal IP address can't be tracked by anyone on the web. Circumvent any online censorship. IP Vanish has more than 1,500 servers in 70 plus locations. Protection when using public Wi Fi, so no one can snoop on your data. And 24 7 support. You can email them, chat with them, and even call them. So go to ipvanish.com forward slash mafia. Claim your 65% savings. They have plans starting at just $3.49 or $31.49 a year. This is the time to sign up. With our discount and the current promotional offerings, you can get a VPN for 65% off their usual offering. IP Vanish is the best of the best, even rated 4.7 out of 5 on Trustpilot, and that's with more than 6,000 reviews. Show these guys some love. Remember, it's ipvanish.com forward slash mafia to get the deal and start protecting yourself online. The 1920s and 30s are remembered as being glamorous. A time of booming financial landscape, new technological marvels, and Gatsby-esque parties. But amidst it all, racial injustice continued to affect minority communities. It was common for people to publish articles in newspapers to bring awareness to the issues that plagued their neighborhoods. Ads in the New York Amsterdam News were part of black New Yorkers' longstanding struggles against Jim Crow North and state-sanctioned violence slash police brutality. Ads were about um, politics. They were about black immigration and naturalization. And many of those ads were about police home invasions, uh, black women's often invisible encounters with police brutality, as well as uh, police corruptions or police corruption within, um, within the city, meaning cops who participated in vice and crime. As a black woman living in Harlem, Stephanie St. Clair witnessed plenty of injustices against her community. She was known to be outspoken against racial injustice and published articles in local newspapers about police brutality. 
St. Clair did not hesitate to denounce what she saw and felt were violence and mistreatment of black uh, you know, citizens at the hands of law enforcement. She would place ads, at prominent ads in city's newspapers and informing black citizens of their legal and constitutional rights. St. Clair repeatedly called out injustices being done to the black community. When her demands for acknowledgement went unanswered, she took up a new angle. She began to run articles about corruption in the New York Police Department. This caught their attention and police officers did not take too kindly to St. Clair's public call-outs. Because of this, many law enforcement agencies were upset with her and took it as an affront, and they kind of saw her as very arrogant and um, used the term uppity in the black community. That was, that was uh, uh, seen as a very offensive term. You know, it was basically a lot of the whites would use that term toward people, blacks, who felt they did not know their place. Stephanie St. Clair was targeted by the police. While the call-outs were a common occurrence at the time, St. Clair had ties to many law enforcement officers and could easily cause many problems for the NYPD. Still, they were intent on silencing her. Well, she was very visible. Um, her race and gender made her visible. Her participation in the numbers racket made her um, visible. And most importantly, her calling out the cops, challenging police authority, testifying publicly in newspaper about their misconduct made her um, a target. But most importantly, she as a black woman was stepping out of her place. And by out of her place, I mean she wasn't being submissive, she wasn't being uh, deferential to whites, and she refused to embrace a code of silence when it came to vice and police officers. And I think they felt, you know, also she was black, she was uh, also female. So that was also another source of connection among some of these very, very, you know, sexist and racist cops. And um, they saw her behavior as an affront to, their, to them and as well. And because of that, she was uh, targeted. In retaliation for the bad press, police arrested Stephanie St. Clair in 1928. She was sentenced to eight months in a workhouse. She was uh, prosecuted on trumped up charges of, you know, uh, number racketing, gambling, and the like. When she emerged from the workhouse, Stephanie St. Clair was determined to do two things. Reclaim her place at the top of the Harlem numbers racket scene and expose the role law enforcement played in New York City's illegal lottery. Stephanie St. Clair was not shy about expressing her opinion publicly. And uh, as you can tell from the description of her, descriptions of her, you know, she was, she was not somebody who hid in the shadows of Harlem. She was out front about everything that she was doing. And, uh, and she had to pay people off in order to, to make that happen. She needed police officers and judges and others in her pockets so that, uh, you know, she could do that. So she could walk, drive around in a limousine and not be, not be bothered. Despite the vulnerable position this put her in, in December 1930, Stephanie St. Clair appeared before the Samuel Seabury Commission to provide testimony for an ongoing investigation concerning corruption in both the NYPD and the Bronx and Manhattan court systems. And she testified against um, what she thought were the rampant corruption within the force, the police force, um, and police forces in major cities at that time, and even probably in smaller towns, where and even today, uh, police corruption is nothing new. So she testified against uh, several of the um, police officers that what she said was illicit businesses and um, dealings that took place within the, uh, among the police and briberies that they took some of them from her and others as well. Regardless of the potential risks, Stephanie Sinclair appeared before the Sam Seaborg Commission in December of 1930. Appearing before the commission, Stephanie Sinclair, of course, lavishly dressed in her mink coat, a chic hat, was ready to testify about her experiences as a numbers banker and really about her business relationships with the police. So according to Stephanie Sinclair, quote unquote, she sent payments of $100 and $500 to a lieutenant who, uh, worked in, who, worked in, who worked at a Harlem precinct and paid cops a total of $6,000 to avoid arrest. And based on this particular candid testimony, a lieutenant and 13 other men were suspended from the NYPD. 
I mean, there's a lot of money that she had paid to officers. And her testimony, in part, led to 18 officers being suspended uh, based on the evidence presented to the Seabury Commission. So uh, ultimately, uh, with all this corruption being revealed, uh, Mayor Jimmy Walker was forced to resign. He was a, a, a very, in many ways, beloved mayor of New York, but he was definitely a a guy who who liked his vice <laughs> and had no problem, you know, with these things going on in his in his city. Uh, but with all of this corruption, people just couldn't take it anymore, and uh, and Jimmy Walker had to go. So uh, Stephanie St. Clair had a little bit to do with that. It was a win for St. Clair and her numbers racket. So she was able to kind of, um, you know, uh, crack that blue wall, so to speak, because of um, what she um, was able to know and what she was able to uh, testify in regards to police corruption. With the trial over, St. Clair returned to her place as the queen of policy rackets. However, change was afoot in Harlem. As prohibition was coming to a close, other New York mafia groups were struggling for business. They caught wind of the Harlem gambling scene and saw new territory to take over. Stephanie St. Clair was not about to let anyone encroach on her business or intimidate her into giving up her earnings. Not the Jewish mafia, not the Italian mafia, and certainly not the infamous mafioso Dutch Schultz. In the next episode, as large New York crime families begin to enter the Harlem crime scene, Stephanie St. Clair stands her ground to hold on to her empire. They're attracted to the numbers racket as early as the 1920s. I mean, by the 1930s, we start to see kind of like the big fish, like uh, uh, Charles Luciano and others being attracted more to Harlem's numbers racket. Stephanie St. Clair's biggest rival was Dutch Schultz. He would primarily, um, if you did not pay for protection laws like that as well, he would. We murdered people, uh, uh, a lot of the black numbers runners up in Harlem who did not provide, um, you know, protection money and, and did not want to give over their or at least part of their um, profits to him. Saint Clair had a solid operation running, and she was not about to let anyone come between her and her business. Stephanie Saint Clair was somebody they could not intimidate, and. Um, you know, and she certainly fought fire fire. She declared famously, quote, I'm not afraid of Dutch Schultz or of any other man living. He'll never touch me. This has been Mafia, an Audio Boom original series hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Lauren Vogel, Blair Payton, Pam Burroughs, Karen Bevan, and Rachel Jacobs. Executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Regan and Stuart Last. Special thanks to LaShawn Harris, Jeff Schumacher, and Elwood Watson for providing expert insight for this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows.